Hey there everyone, Drake Siraj here from AI Foundations. In the following call you are about to watch is a live discussion from my AI Foundations community. And this is part of a five part series on automations and the importance of them and everything you need to know about them. This call in specific, we're going over how to start automations with the group. Anybody who just wanted to join the call for this little workshop that we're hosting within the group this month, uh, they were able to do that. And what you're going to notice is a lot of people just jump in, ask questions, we help them out live, and we have a little presentation that we show, but the main purpose of these calls is to solve problems. And really just getting down the basics of how you can even start an automation and where to begin, and just giving ideas. Now, this is all taking place within the AI Foundations community. So if you're interested and you want to join a group like this, like a network of AI people who are thinking about it all day, then I highly recommend considering this. I'll leave a link in the description or the top pinned comment if this interests you. Now, this is meant to be your final stop for artificial intelligence. Here we have the community section where anybody can jump in, list some news, projects they're working on, things they need help with, questions, answers. Really, this is where everyone is just talking and really getting enthralled with AI. We have people uploading AI news all the time, including myself. Um, giving some nice motivation here from Ben. We also have a classroom section full of multiple different courses on AI and multiple courses to come in the future. Also, we have a calendar, right? We have a calendar with these live calls, which you're about to see. We have different topics every month. We have a live Q&A every Thursday. It's just overall a really amazing community to be a part of. I've learned much more in the past two months than I have in the past year of studying artificial intelligence alone. So this community is amazing. I've learned so much. People are loving it. If you want to join, I'll leave that in the description or the top pinned comment. But now let's get into this AI automations call where we're going to be learning about starting automations, uh, particularly in make, but we do go into things like Zapier a little bit too, and just talk strategy about how we can use different tools in order to help us start and the different triggers for automations. All right, I'm going to quit rambling so you can get into the group discussion. I hope you enjoy, and I will see you in the next video, or I'll see you within the community. Hey everyone, how's it going? Doing well, how are y'all? Good to see you. Doing well. Well, thank you. Good to see hey, you, Jeffrey. Carla. Hey, Carla. How's it going, everyone? Drake's just making his coffee. You know how he has to take his time with that. So <laughs> he's like, I'm going to step out of the room. I'll be back before 11. It's the All most right, important whatever. thing. What's up, Drake? Drake. Something hey was there, coffee. Everyone. Oh, yeah. Oh. I was. I had to go make a coffee before the call. <laughs> you start I just the... figured I'd let these guys in. Oh, yeah. How's it going? Oh, yeah. Andy, do you have your, uh, your AI Foundations notebook with you? I want to see know... it. <laughs> yes, I know. I know he ended up getting one. I I, uh, I do have it, and I'm looking, yeah, figuring out my camera right now. You're good. <laughs> Keith, showing up on time for the call. I love it. I tried this time, man. <laughs> Jeffrey, yeah, I like your space you're in. You're in the you're in the stars right now. Oh yeah, definitely, man. Always in the stars. <laughs> <laughs> if it's Jeffrey, not I got your DM that said your book's ninety percent done. Yeah, I gotta, get, I gotta get to that. Just breeze through it, man. I, I go down rabbit holes, man. That's all. It's just a lot of rabbit holes. <laughs> That's all what AI is about is going down the rabbit holes. <laughs> I love it too. All right. Has anybody started, started their soon? automation for the automations contest? Yeah, that's not yet. Can I yeah. just touch on that? Yeah. yeah. Um I'm starting on one, but uh, as you probably uh, heard, um, I'm in the middle of a, a cooking uh, season at the moment with my pop-up restaurant. So I'm working 16 hours, and today's my day off and wow. Thursday also. So that's, that's nice because then I can watch the, the live calls. But uh, it's it's quite heavy at the moment. But uh, at the end of the month, uh, at 24th, I'm I'm free. So I'm finishing for three for, for three weeks. And then I will nice. make it. so it's but I'm now preparing for it and then I'm gonna make it from the 23rd. But it's until 28th you can Yep. Until the 28th, and nobody's entered right now. So if one person enters, they're gonna win okay. probably over four hundred dollars. Yep. I see I see you down there, Ben, getting the hands ready, getting the hands ready for the automation. Love it. You have Love to it. include AI. <laughs> Good afternoon, Larry. Larry, it does not have to include AI. Um yeah. I got all I mean, kinds of automations. I just built for your your uh, your template, your, your brain template. So 
<laughs> oh, it's keyed out. Yeah. They don't have to include Andy. that. <laughs> yeah, I see that. That's What's funny. that? They don't have to. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just talking about. Andy was trying to show his uh, his notebook, but oh, but it was yeah. keyed out. You know, because yeah. of, oh, that's nice. Great. That's awesome. Awesome. Love it. Nice. First, first of my swag. Is that there the we storm? go. Awesome. Yeah, Larry. All on yeah. the black shirts. So the black shirts, cardinal shirts. I want to, yeah, I want to get one of the black uh, foundation shirts. Oh, yeah. I'm, a I'm a swag guy. I like it. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right, looks like we're about ready to get into it. I'll just hop right into the presentation. If at any point you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, interrupt me. You don't even have to raise your hand. Just interrupt and say and ask, and Carter and I can Carter and I can get some help or the community, right? We can I'll give our opinions. So I'm going to share my screen here. And this is going to be call two of five. And we're going to go over everything start everything that has to do with starting automations in this call, because an automation can't start if you don't know how to start it. And there are so many different ways that you can actually start automations. It's it's insane, but I just wanted to go over a few of them, and just get some ideas on the floor, so that if you're struggling to think of different ways that you can start an automation, or you don't know of some ways that you can start an automation, then this will be a good starting point um, for you. Okay, so let's dive into starting automations. Automations can start in many different ways. As I've been saying, they can start when databases are updated, a product is purchased from your store, when a certain account uploads to social media, or maybe when you upload to social media. For myself, that one's really important because if I'm trying to run a solopreneur business, right, and I'm usually the only one working on the AI Foundation's YouTube channel, if I want to distribute that content out, I need a way to have that content being watched. So that would be an example of a way that I could start an automation is watching certain social media accounts. You can watch when someone follows you on platforms like X or Instagram, or when an email is received into a certain address, when a form is submitted on your website, when a specific keyword is mentioned in a chat like Slack, uh, when a scheduled time or date is reached, when a file is added to cloud storage, or even when a call is made to a specific API, webhook, and more. So tons of different ways that you can start automations, really hundreds, and obviously we wouldn't be able to cover them all, but I think the point of this call is to just get some base ideas on the floor and also help everyone directly and see if their use case is possible for an automation for the way that they want to start their automation. So let's take an in-depth look. Now, scheduling in Make, I think, is very important to look at first because in Make, you have a wide, a wide range of scheduling options to choose from. As you can see over here on the right, you can schedule at regular intervals. So per every 15 minutes, your automation will run every 10 minutes, every five minutes, every hour. You can run an automation once at a certain time and date. You can run it every day. You can run it on certain days of the week. You can run it on certain days of the month, specified dates of the month or you can just have it run on demand. So when something hits, let's say a Notion database or a new lead is in your CRM, as soon as that lead hits the database then an automation triggers and is run, that would be an example of on demand. And they even have advanced settings that you can go super in depth on and have really custom time date scenarios going on here. So when scheduling is turned on and your specified time arrives, you can run and create pretty much any automation you desire. And there's a couple of different ways to actually think about scheduling automations out in order to start them. And we're going to get into those in a minute, but knowing that you can schedule automations and make, I think will come in handy um, when we add the other automation starters with it. So this is a way that you can definitely start your automation. You can just say, okay, once we get to this time, run this action or do these steps. So that's one way that you can start an automation. So we're starting off good here. Great. Can I ask a quick question about Make really quick? Just a general Go question. For it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, about I, I know Make is available. It's you know base. Its base sort of plan is free. And yeah, is the limitation just the amount of scenarios you can have, or the, or or are you limited on the intervals? You know, like the, if, you, if you get a really aggressive with the interval, is that something that would be covered? Yeah, uh, I think I think interval and scheduling may may be a little bit limited. 
-hmm. and also operations. I'm not sure if there's a scenario limit, but I know that there's a, like a base amount of operations you can okay. use per month for free. I but just ran I think, out of scenario or out of operations. Oh yeah. It, it's kind of a lot though, isn't it? I'm surprised how many operations you can do for it's a thousand. A it's a thousand. Yeah. yeah it's pretty, you um, can also um, use Zapier, which I yeah, think. I moved over to Zapier because I got, actually got the, the thing working, but then I ran out of operations. So I had to go to gotcha. Zapier. I think Zapier does have a plan that's unlimited as well for operations. I want to say, I just don't know if it's, it, I know that they have a bit of a different pricing structure. So look at Zapier as well. One thing I found is um, operations. You won't, at least for me, I don't think I'll use a lot of operations going forward. It's syncing old data. It's mm -hmm. using up all the operations. And then once it's synced, it's going to be just, you know, your how many times a week you do it or, or whatever. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And if you can, you can just like hopefully import that stuff as like a CSV in a lot of cases or some other way, like a little bit more efficiently for the, for the, uh, the old data. And then hopefully you can just set up the real time mm -hmm. sync for the, for the updated stuff. Drake, Drake, just a quick question. What's up, uh, Uncle? Are you guys planning on mainly using Make or also Zapier? Is your focus mainly on Make or also Zapier? I think the, the, foc the focus for me at least is mainly on Make, but I think Zapier is super powerful and you can use it with Make. I think Make's the most beginner friendly one, in my yeah. opinion, to get started. And it's yeah. just fun drag and drop, easy to see your flows, really basic yeah. verbiage. It's kind of that fun way to, to start automations that... It's a little bit more user friendly, but Zapier is needed sometimes. And I I use Zapier for some automations actually. Okay. So I think it's kind of interchangeable. Interchangeable. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that yeah. Make can do that Zapier can't, and vice versa though. Yeah. So they're different in some ways, but like for Notion, for instance, I know that Make is way better for Notion um, than as compared to Zapier. But for uh, Gmail uh zapier seems to have some more uh automations that you can trigger with it zapier own notion uh i think it's uh, the other way around i think make and uh, i think uh, notion bought make okay so the other good one is relay.io relay.io relay. Uh, relay. okay. i've heard of that uh, awesome. I use that no i'm sorry run it's run.relay.app is what i have on my phone yeah relay.app Okay. Relay. Relay, relay is like the actual like name of it, though, right? I'm sorry. Relay. relay yeah, yeah is exactly. Okay. Yeah. Relay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Good questions. Good questions. And yes, if you have an automation in Zapier, feel free to upload that to the contest as well, because any or just a GPT automation, anything that is automated is become well. Automations are becoming easier to make with everything and AI. So any automation is powerful. It doesn't really matter what app you use, but yeah, I like make. It's what I found the easiest to use uh, and just get started with as well. But Zapier, another great option. All right. Yeah. So this is going to come in handy knowing that we have the ability to schedule things. And scheduling is the backbone of creating good automations because the goal of an automation is to create something that's so good it can run on autopilot with a schedule and have no human intervention. You know the automation is an actual automation when you don't have to look at it. It's just running in the background, completing everything you need to do. You take some time, you set it up once, you go through a testing and revisions phase. And then once that automation is on autopilot, you know that you have something successful. And... In my opinion, there are two types of scheduling methods we use, schedule to act and schedule to watch. I think this is important. And the main thing we're going to be focusing on today is schedule to watch because I want the ability to actually take information from outside applications, whether that's in a database or a social media post or a news article, and then have some actions created around that. Schedule to act is still very powerful, but it's going to just be taking place in make. You know, it's mainly on that time interval. So I'll get into some examples so you can understand the difference between schedule to act and schedule to watch right now. So let's break these down. Schedule to act. These are direct actions taken after a certain time or date is reached in make. When using scheduling to act, your automation will run no matter what, as soon as your time hits. So this is only dependent on a certain scheduled interval or a certain time that you select. And this automation will run when that certain time hits. It's not 
really dependent upon anything else, right? You don't need to type in a keyword and then have your automation run. You don't need a new lead to enter your database and then have your automation run. It's just, okay, as soon as this time hits, the automation is going through. And I'll show you an example of that. So this is something I created in Make this morning, actually. Very, very simple, right? This would be an example of a schedule to act. We have Anthropic Claude, and then we have that message going to a Google Doc. And as you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, I have this scheduled at daily at 8.02 in the morning. Every time at 8.02 in the morning, it's going to run through this no matter what. This is something that will run on autopilot in the background. And what this is doing is it's creating a random AI joke and it's giving me the joke and that's it. Something super basic. Now it's kind of a silly example. <laughs> um, and I guess unless you're a comedian and you need some, and you need some material, but... This is a very basic example of how a schedule to act automation would work. No matter what, when I set the time, it's going to run and it's going to send it to my Google Doc connection and it's going to make a Google Doc. So if I look at the time right now, it's 1114. And if I set this up to schedule at, let's just say 1116, so we have some time. Okay, and I hit okay, and then save. What you're going to notice when 1116 comes, in one minute is that it actually creates a new a new Google Doc based on this anthropic Claude. So this is scheduled to act, right? We're telling it to run at a certain time and it's going to do so. And it's going to actually enter this database here. And it's not dependent upon anything else other than the time. I know I keep repeating myself. I probably sound like a broken record, but as you can see, I have three jokes in here right now for me testing this. And these are all from eight o'clock in the morning. But when 1116 hits, by 11.17, I should have another AI joke in here if this automation is scheduled out and saved correctly. So we will look at that in a minute. As soon as that uh, time actually updates in 10 seconds, we will see this automation run and then a new AI joke will actually get added to this database. So it says, why did the AI cross the road to get to the other bias? I don't know if that's too funny or not, but you know, it's adding in all these jokes and hopefully, the scenario will run since it's 11.16 before 11.17. We will get a new AI joke. Yeah, so as you can see, that automation just ran. And it says last modified 11.16. So this would be an example of scheduling an automation to act on a certain task right away. So now when I click on this, we have something. And it completely repeated the joke. Why did the AI cross the road to get to the other bias? So I would have to set up some parameters in here or maybe have a database watching don't reuse certain jokes. But that's an example of how that would work. Now, Break schedule... one question. Yeah, what's up? Um, regarding the API usage. So basically in uh, ChatGPT or in the other systems, I think there is also some, some payment required. So all the time you um, put in an API request, you have to pay for yep. that. Or how is that um, handled here in the, in the LLMs? Yeah, most of the time, if you're going to use a large language model, there's going to be some form of payment because it costs to actually run it. And it depends on how long your request is and how many tokens it uses. Most of the time, tokens will have a cost attached to them. So when you use a thousand tokens, it will take up X amount of dollars. But usually the requests are pretty small. And um, I mean, the amount of money it's taking is quite small. So for example, I had this automation that i'll show you real quick uh, the ai content system this was taking in a lot of information and each one of these is using up tokens each one of my open ai modules and this entire automation created four social media posts for me and all i had to do was load in like five dollars into the open ai platform and it only used about 30 cents per time i run this and it gets me four social media posts so it's really dependent on how extensive you use it and based on uh, what you put in there drake you've got about 30 more years worth yeah. of uh <laughs> usage coming to you right yeah that's right that's right so yeah you're going to have to probably pay oh well, not probably you will have to pay um or load some money in in order to use the api but perplexity for example i pay 20 dollars a month for perplexity as i'm sure some of you do and that gives you five dollars free per month of api credits i believe so that's kind of a fun one to use if you like using it already and you want to get some free credits to mess around with 
I call them free. You're still paying $20 a month to get $5 free. But yeah, in regards to large language models, uh, when you start integrating AI, you will have to pay, but it's mainly cents per per use, if if anything at all. Drake, um, can I ask Okay, you great. Thanks. Yep. Yeah, what's up, Gene? Hey, um, and thank you for being so kind to me last week. I swear I would it's easier for me to birth a baby than it is to figure out these automations. But um <laughs> sure the, um I noticed that like when I ran through setting up the blog automation that I ended, you know, I had to get a paid quad account and then add five bucks in for tokens. Right, right. So now I'm starting to work on the video, the video automation, which, you know, y'all <laughs> send liquor. Um, and <laughs> That one that talks about ChatGPT, which then, which I already have a pro account for that, but then adding tokens for that. So <laughs> it, I, I guess this is going to go back a little bit to sort of the Zapier and make question. Like, okay. are these things completely interchangeable, these APIs, or are there certain automations that it, it's going to be better that I use the Claude API and then certain other automations that I'm going, it's going to be better if I use the ChatGPT Automation. Yeah, it depends. It depends on what responses you like better. Generally speaking, if you're using Claude and ChatGPT to generate text content, it will be fairly similar. So you're just going to have to look at the API cost and see, okay, which model is going to be best for my use case. Usually, if you can use Claude on something to generate text content, you can use OpenAI's ChatGPT API or vice versa. Like, like if you like, for example, I know that you set up the automation using Claude with Carter, right? Mm -hmm. on that tutorial and then in the newsletter tutorial you see me switch to open ai and use that right mm -hmm. so if i go back to my newsletter automation real quick you could just use claude and it would have pretty much the same effect i would take in the principles of what i'm applying in chat gbt like the same prompt and it may need modified a little bit but an llm is an llm you know and claude 3 opus and chat gbt 4 are pretty much the same. I mean, they they are they definitely have their differences. But if you're doing a newsletter automation and you're and you're using uh, Open Open AI or Claude, it really doesn't matter. I think you you can achieve the exact same effect in either one. You know, there's just so I, you know I'm starting to accumulate. There's a Make and then there's a Claude and then it's the Claude API. And then there's the yeah. you know like now I have yeah. three pro accounts for three different you know, yeah. AI systems and tokens on each one of those. And I'm like, okay, is there a way to consolidate this a little bit? Or is yeah, that you, how it's going to be? Okay. You can, you can. And you can even okay. test them out. Maybe you can load $5 into OpenAI, see if you like the responses better. Um, you know, and I will say that I do like OpenAI because you have the ability to create really detailed assistance in the back end. I'm not sure if you do in Claude, but, you know, if you're just doing something like this, like where you're only using create chat completions and you're not even using a an assistant in the back end to gain to gain that full potential of well to use the full potential of open ai and you're just creating message content in here and getting responses like any other llm then claude would most likely be fine for your use case and some people even think it's better the responses it just depends on what you like so yeah i would use claude if that's if that's what you want to do and you want to consolidate down using claude wouldn't be an issue Thank you so much. Of course, of course. So that was scheduled to act. Okay, um, scheduled to act, you know, we had that automation run, create us a joke, add it to a database. But then there's also something that we're going to be going a little bit more in depth on today, which is scheduled to watch. Now there are things outside of make.com that are being watched by make. No, these are things outside of make that are being watched by make or Zapier in order to complete an action. This can be another app or tool you use, another database, et cetera. And like I said, schedule to watch will be the main focus today because we can all set up a schedule to act and have these cool automations complete. But sometimes it's just good to know the information that you can actually watch and bring back in and uh, have that scheduled out to complete actions after a certain qualifying factor is met. What I mean by that, because that might sound confusing and like a bunch of jumbled words that don't make any sense, is let's say that I want something to happen within this database anytime something is added to this database, right? I could set up that automation then in the schedule to act to 
actually add something to the database, but what happens when it's added to the database? This in when I say database, I just mean this Google Drive folder, right? I could set up an automation so that when something is added to this database, something else happens. So I could set up a make automation to watch that database. And I could set this up again on a schedule. Maybe I want it to look at the database, in this case, every 10 minutes. And if something is new in the database, I could have it do something like send an update message to my phone, right? Using this little module right here called Vibit Notifications. I use this for my product purchases, actually. So whenever somebody purchases a product on my Stripe, I actually have a Zapier uh, automation set up for this. It actually sends a notification to my phone that somebody purchased. I think that's kind of cool. And you can add custom sound effects, a little cha-ching sound, big dopamine hit, right? But anyway, for this example, I connected up my AI jokes database right here. So I'm having it watch my AI daily jokes. And this would be an example of a way to start an automation. Every 10 minutes, it's looking at my database right now. And it's asking, well, and it's looking at the database scene, is there any new information in this database that I haven't already looked over? And if there is, it's going to send an update message to my phone saying new AI joke detected. So that anytime I have my phone by me, I get a notification that looks like this. It just actually came in three minutes ago while we were on the call. I'll try to show you what that looks like uh, by holding up my phone to the camera here. Hopefully it stays open. But as you can see, I have that new AI joke notification from Vibit coming in on my phone automatic, automatically, which is very neat. So you can give yourself notifications when certain tasks happen, but that would just be an example of a schedule to watch because the only reason it sends a notification to my phone is because it's watching this Google Drive folder and it's saying, okay, there's something new, so I'm going to send a notification. But if it's already been looked at, then it won't send it. That's where the choose where to start comes in. If you have from now on selected, then it will uh, choose from now on. You know, uh, If you ever want to set up a watch scenario, and you want to test it out, right click your document and hit choose where to start. And then you can choose manually all the different documents within that folder. As you can see, we have all four of my AI jokes that I could choose from in order to start that automation in order to practice on. Or I could just choose all and it will watch all of them and restart like it hasn't seen them before. Or from now on, I can select and only the messages from now on will it be watching for every 10 minutes once scheduling is on. So that's an example of a schedule to watch and a schedule to act. I hope that makes sense on the difference. You know, schedule to act, again, dependent upon the time and date. When something happens, then it triggers. I mean, when, when a certain time hits or a certain date hits that you set up, then it automatically runs through the action. The schedule to watch is always running, right? It's running every 10 minutes, but that doesn't mean it's going to go through and send the message update to my phone if there's not a new database item. So it's kind of dependent on that new data entering the database. Okay, do we have any questions so far or any statements or any, uh, you know, any tasks that, that you can see yourself automating now that you have a little bit better of an understanding on schedule to watch, schedule to act? Drake, did you want me to share the uh, webhook really quick? Yeah, go for it. The prompt improver. It's just a really quick one. I just wanted to share with you guys really quick. I won't take up too much time if you guys have questions or anything here. Um, so I just built an automation using a webhook, which is, I believe it would be a scheduled watch. Is that how you yep. would classify it, Drake? Scheduled yep. watch? Yep. Um, so this is similar to Notion, but Notion doesn't have webhooks. Uh, the same way built in that Airtable does. So Airtable has a, an actual tab here called automations. And I just have some data in here. I have an input prompt. And this is just where I put in a prompt. Let's say I'm using it to prompt in mid journey like we've been doing. And I want to automate this process of revising my prompt and getting a better uh, version of the prompt. So as you can see right here, it's giving me the... Uh, revised prompt after I give it the input prompt. Now, this is just a two-step automation. And it's basically saying if the box is checked, then it's going to change the status to in queue. And then on this automation, it's actually going to run some JavaScript code. And believe it or not, guys, I generated this like right before this call. It took me like probably 10 minutes to build this automation. And 
it gave me all the JavaScript that I need. And all I did was screenshot my Airtable here. I asked it for all the information that I needed. I gave it my webhook URL, everything that it needed essentially. And here at the very end, it gave me the code that I needed. Now, now that's uh, definitely going to be helpful. Um, very powerful. If you if you want to uh, get JavaScript or anything like that, if you want to do webhooks, and I don't really know a whole lot about that stuff, to be honest with you guys. I just have it uh, basically done by Claude. So you can run a script if the status is in queue. So all that's doing is saying if over in my table here, this status is set to in queue, then it's going to run that and it's going to send some information for me. So all I did had in that conversation with Claude was here's what I want to send from Airtable to make with my automation. And here's a screenshot of my database. So you can see all the fields that I'm using. And then what it does is it actually sends over the input prompt and it sends over the status and it sends which row it's referring to here. So once it does that over in make, which looks just basically like this, it's just taking in data with this webhook. This webhook is watching my Airtable at all times. And then it's actually going to send that data to a GPT that improves my prompts for me. So this GPT, like I said, it took me like five minutes to build this thing. I built it right before this call. And all it's doing is it's taking in that input prompt from the from webhook. Your, from your Airtable? From the Airtable. So I'll show you guys really fast how this works. And then I'll show you the assistant that I created. And it's based on a GPT. So you can, that's the, the other cool thing is I know a lot of you guys use GPTs. You can just transfer your GPTs into assistants and then you can have all of your GPTs running and connected to everything. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to do an input prompt. So I could just do, um, let's just do a dog in a field. And then all I have to do, because this, if I, uh, is, it'll run immediately as data arrives, all I have to do is check this box right here. And then this input prompt is going to go off. So you'll see that a few steps happen here. First, it says in queue. Once that in queue happens, my next automation is now starting and sending the webhook data to make. So now make should be processing this request. And I'm not sure if it did yet. I think it will. I think it will. Sometimes it takes a couple seconds, but it's going to send it back to Airtable without without you having to do anything, right? Yeah, exactly. So it should just come right back into here, but I am just going to run it because I don't know if it is going to run. I might need to refresh this page, but typically that would run immediately as this hits in queue. Something is not set up right there, but then it should give me my revised prompt here in a moment. Okay. Seems like it's not working. So let me try this with a new record because this totally should work. So I'll just do a dog in a field again. We'll check the box now that this is running. Should switch to in queue and then it should trigger the webhook. Yeah. I wonder if there's a delay in webhook or was it working? No, that, no these were working right before I demoed this. That's usually how it goes though, right? Yeah. Right before, right before well, the demo. That's, demo. Running now. that's how that's how demos work. It's it's yeah. running now. No, it's running. <laughs> there um, we go. So as you can see, yeah, this oh, yeah. one, it just ran. So it was just because the automation wasn't running yet. Um, but you can typically do it immediately as data arrives with the scenario runs. So typically this works just fine. And as you can see, um, I don't That's know sweet. why it's giving me like these weird prompts. This first one worked fine. I am going to need to go in and like tweak my base prompt though, because this one, a cat in a field worked where it gave me a cat in a peaceful field sitting, you know, it, it gave a relevant response for these ones. It's been giving me this same exact uh, prompt <laughs> right here. So I think what it's doing is it's pulling a prompt directly from my example prompts. Mm. So I'll show you guys how that works. So the assistant here, it's just a mid-journey bot, and you can get here by going to platform.openai.com, going to the assistance tab, and then you can create basically what are GPTs right here. So I've uploaded my file, which is basically just this file right here. It's just a knowledge file on how to use mid-journey. And then I've also uploaded 
uh, just a basic set of instructions. So it has all the information it needs. It's using GPT-4.0. Oh, and I've been able to connect this very simply to make just by filling out which assistant I want to use right here and then giving it the input prompt from my Airtable. So I just wanted to show you guys that really quick. It's just a quick example of how the uh, web hooks work. And even if you don't have like super, uh, you know, high knowledge of JavaScript and stuff like that, you can use tools like Claude 3.5 to help you figure things out. So you can, right. at this point, I should be able to just enter pretty much anything and uh, it should give me. So let's see if it can give me ice cream. All right. Make sure this runs. And, oh, no, I want to check the box. And I want to see if I can show you guys as this runs one more time here. So, yep, it just grabbed the webhook, ice cream, passed the ice cream to ChatGPT, and hopefully <laughs> ChatGPT gives me better ice cream prompt here. Mother, just a quick question. Um, yeah, I don't know I... why it's doing this. I think I need to uh, go in and look at my assistant. Um, yes, Remco. Are you sharing that uh, mid-journey uh, reference file that you made? Uh, yeah, you... actually, it's a reference file that I just literally pulled out of uh, Google Docs. Like right before I jumped on this call, I was like, I'm going to make a webhook example really quick, right? So um, this one in particular probably isn't the best one because it's not actually yielding the best results. But the one that I have in the community on, I believe the, hold on, let me see if I can find the module for you. It does go over a GPT and how to install custom knowledge into that GPT. Um, but I need to improve the source knowledge on this one I did in this demo because that wasn't a great prompt anyways. All right, so, thank you for sharing, Carter. Yeah, I did, I did want to really quick show it is uh, supercharging prompts with LLMs. So this just shows the knowledge file. Yeah, this is the one that I should have used because this is the good one. And then there's also instructions file. So wow. I, in this video, I go over how to create a GPT. Right. Nice. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, Cart. Thank you so much for sharing, dude. For sure. Love for it. sure. Sorry, the demo didn't go 100%, but no, you guys good. can not, see the not, power of it, yeah. I think. It's just yeah. like a matter of tweaking things in the, uh, in the assistant. Really not bad for a quick 10-minute creation, honestly. All right, I'm going to get back into it. And I just want to go over some automation triggers. Let's get let's get our brain spinning on different ways and ideas for starting automations. That way if you're kind of in the in the water right now and you're and you're not really knowing how to swim and you're like, you know, I like automations, I think that I could use them, but I don't really know how I would use them or even ways that I would start using them. I hope that this gives you some ideas on different ways you can trigger automations in order to create some very cool things. And the fact of the matter is, is there's so many different ways you can start automations. And I think the main thing that you need to understand before starting them is just knowing that you're going to have to try them and test some things out uh, to see if it's going to work. But let's get into some ways that we can trigger automations. So this one is similar to the example that I showed you with the Google Drive, and that's by um, watching for updated databases. If you have data either coming in or updating from an Excel sheet, a CRM, a lead database, a Notion account, your Google Drive, or any other database, then it can pretty much be automated, whether that's with a webhook or a direct API connection, just how you would set up ChatGPT, OpenAI, in Make, for instance, you know, you'd hook up your API connection and then you can get all that data into Make. So what happens here is usually newer updated data comes into a database for data. Now a database, this could be like a Google Drive, an Airtable, a Notion, or anywhere that stores your information. And when that new data is being added to that database, Make, this is the beautiful thing about Make, is it, it can always watch that database to see okay, is there any new information here? Is there any new leads entering this database? Did somebody follow me? Did somebody comment on my post? It's always watching for these events that's happening. And if it's not true, if somebody didn't comment on your post, then it will just remain quiet. It won't do anything. But if somebody does comment on your post, follow you, you receive an email or something along those lines that uh, you have an automation attached to, then Make will take that 
and begin your automation actions, the steps that you have set up and how you want to deal with that information in order to make your life easier, more productive, more efficient, save more time, right? A lot of things, a lot of benefits of automations, but, and you can use the power of AI. This is what's making automation so, so powerful nowadays is you have AI to help you automate things. Automations have always been cool and building out systems, but with AI, it opens the door for a lot more automations. So updating database is one example. If you have a CRM or Great, a lead one data, question. Yeah. What's up? Um, is make also capable to monitor the local computer or is it only for for internet resources? I think Carter touches on that a little bit. Um, um, yeah, I'll I think you on... have before. Yeah, because I think Car Carter's a little bit more versed on that side of things than I am, but I'll have I'll have him kind of explain how, how he does that stuff. So did, did you remember the example where I was showing how I was talking with Claude and asking it how to create a webhook script? I don't know if he was there for that call or not. Were you there? Just it was just a minute ago. I'm talking about like oh. where I was talking about how. Um, hold on, I'll try to I'll try to pull up a a quick preview of my conversation with Claude, where I had it create a webhook script for me. So I'll break this down for you guys, and hopefully this makes a bit more sense. So I basically. That air table that I had, and you can think of this like your offline stuff. So, like, give me an example of something offline that you would you would use. Basically, maybe if something happened on my uh, computer, so I could also maybe monitor my my mailbox, or if um, an event happened, so in the uh, maybe if an error occurs or something. Okay, yeah, so the, the triggering of that would be the key point. So you'd have to figure out what is going to trigger this automation first and what it's going to need access to. And then using JavaScript locally, you can ask Claude to create a script that communicates with make.com and you can get a webhook from make. And you, in many cases, should be able to get information from your local machine to Claude if this script is running on your machine at the moment. So you would have to get Claude to write you some code. And I recommend Claude because it's it just works the best. And then if you have issues, like I had an issue with um, Airtable where I didn't see a place to put the webhook URL that it told me to get from Make. So I was like, I don't see a webhook URL. And it says, oh, sorry, it's under run script. And then it gives me the script to paste in. And it tells, it walks me through the process here. So you just need to work with it and, and say, like, here's another thing is it wasn't passing along the right information for me. It was only passing along certain details. So I said, you need to pass along the input script as well, or the input prompt as well when you transfer that data. So it will configure this script for you and you can create this script file on your computer and run the script and it should be able to communicate with make from there hey Carter, on. don't you have don't you have a local a local automation that takes the Zoom calls and uploads it to Vimeo automatically for you? That from is your what desktop? I was. I, I haven't I haven't finished that yet. That's why. Okay. Uh, okay. That's why they they aren't. I'm actually behind on uh call recordings because I'm trying to get that automation to work. But <laughs> I'll um I'll I'll be doing the next few ones manually. Probably. Yes, it's it's definitely possible though, Ulrich. It's definitely possible yep. to have. So if you're if you have a folder on your desktop or something to watch that folder, it's going to be a little bit more complicated, but it depends say, on the file. Like it depends on what you want to do. If you're just trying to grab a packet of information, it's a bit easier. Like text information. If you're trying to manipulate files and things like that, it can get more to be more challenging. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm sure file type has a has a role in that too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Good question. Very good question. All right. Or you could do um, PowerShell. PowerShell, right. Yeah, good point, Larry. Good point. Very you good can, point. You can, ask, you can ask Claude to help you with PowerShell too, but that can get a bit risky, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> good point, Larry. PowerShell is very right. powerful, but uh, you, uh, that's a good point. I would probably do it on a sandbox machine first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've risked some things 
asking chat GPT to do some things for me or Claude to do some things for me, but I wouldn't recommend it. I just not with a good conscience. Cause I mean, use this at your own risk. Like if you don't know how to use these, these tools, um, or these, uh, programming languages, especially like PowerShell and stuff, like you could probably mess up your computer if, uh, you pasted something in there and it, and it didn't, if work. you're not ready to blow up your machine and start over, <laughs> you know, <if> you use, <laughs> which I'm sure a lot of us have done, you know, when oh, testing yeah. things and whatnot, but I yes. probably, probably a lot of people on this call are comfortable with that. It's never fun, but yeah, you yeah, have for to be sure. ready. You, have, you sure. have to be ready to start over. <laughs> yeah. 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 You need, Good you need a, to... you need a burner computer. That's for sure. Yeah. Great suggestion though, Larry, because that's super powerful. Yes. Very cool. So I'm just going to give some examples of different ways to like watch updating databases, like literal things that you can click and make. For example, this top notion one just watches database items. So it will trigger an entire automation when a database item is created or updated. So it doesn't just have to be newly created items, but updated at items as well. So if you have a CRM database, for example, and they update from maybe 10 days followed up to 11 days follow up, and you want to make sure that you follow up after 11 days, then it could run through an 11 day follow up automation. Uh, if you have, like, for example, Salesforce down here watching records, watching record fields. So you can, you can run certain things and, and complete certain tasks, not only when new things are added, but also when things are updated as well. So that's very powerful. Google Drive, for instance, in the middle here, you can watch files in a folder. And that'll trigger when a file is created or modified, watch all files, watch certain folders. So you can get really specific with this. And like I said, it's either modified or created, not just created. And also things like Google Sheets and Excel, you can watch when certain cells are updated and then have an automation run, or maybe when a new row is added. Maybe you have a Google Sheet that deals with finance. Maybe when a new subscription is added, it completes a whole new row. So when that new row is added, it triggers another thing and updates your budget automatically for you or something like that. Or maybe you have your receipts being pulled in from your email to Google Sheets and that updates another database somewhere else. Um, really, it's hard to give set in stone examples because everyone's systems, everyone's apps and everyone's workflows are completely different. But these are just some examples of how you could watch certain databases for changes and then update or modify certain things after that change happens. Another one that's super powerful is RSS feeds. And this enables users to follow various websites or even social media accounts using a single news aggregator. This continuously monitors these sites for updates, eliminating the need, eliminating the need for manual checks. So this might be a little confusing, but I wanna show you an example and walk you through kind of an RSS feed um, application, right? There's this app called rss.app. I think it's like $20 a month and I'm starting to definitely, uh, I'm, I'm using up a lot of my uh, subscription costs here. I've, I've just, ever since automations, ever since I've started studying automations, I've started paying a, a lot of money on some, some apps, but this rss.app is super powerful because you can sc almost scrape any web page and watch it for updates as it comes in. This is one that I think might be useful for a lot of you because if I go to my feeds, as you can see, I have three different feeds right here. I have one for my YouTube videos. So it's always watching my YouTube channel. And whenever I upload a new YouTube video, it will update my feed and it will add my new YouTube video to the feed. So then once I have that feed, I can add that feed to make and trigger something when something new is added to the feed. So I'll show you an example of that real quick. If I hit new feed, there's all sorts of different things you can choose from. This is what I like about this RSS app is it really can help you. This, it helps you walk through the process step by step. So if I go to Instagram RSS feed, for example, I can enter the Instagram page of anybody or you can just explore topics. So you can explore hashtags fashion. If I hit try now on fashion, it's only going to take less. It'll take less than 20 seconds. And now anytime something comes in with the hashtag fashion, as you can see, this post was posted 10 seconds ago, it will update this feed. So, I mean, posts are going to be updating on this hashtag fashion uh, feed quite a bit, but if I'm really into fashion and I want to study new fashion trends, I could hit save feed and then I could copy this URL and then over in make.com, if I hit create a new scenario, I could have an automation be running 
whenever something new is actually added to that feed. So RSS app uh, has the ability to watch RSS feed items. So you can have multiple different feeds and all I have to do is paste in that URL and hit okay. And if I hit select the first RSS feed item, it's bringing in all of those different uh, posts that have had the word uh, hashtag fashion in them. So it's a really good way to study trending topics or to study specific social media accounts because you can even come in here to RSS feed and you can type in any URL. I could type in my website, AIfoundations.io. And if I had a blog post, then it would update that feed with all my recent blog posts. So if I go to my YouTube, for instance, and I just want to create a feed so that whenever I upload a new video, I can take an action uh, right away. I could just copy my YouTube video URL, right? YouTube.com uh, at AI Foundation slash videos. If I copy that and create a feed around my YouTube channel, what that's going to do is it's continuously going to be looking for my new YouTube videos. And what I decide to do with those YouTube videos is entirely up to me now, right? As you saw in my newsletter automation, as soon as I uploaded the new YouTube video, I got the transcript from my YouTube video. And then what I did with that transcript is I created a newsletter around it. And that's something that's completely automated, right? All I would have to do after setting up this RSS feed is to just upload a YouTube video. And then my newsletter would be automated because I have something that's actually watching my social media for me and pulling in all those results. So now I have this new URL here. And if I go to RSS feed, and I paste it in and I hit okay. Now when I hit select the RSS feed item, as you can see, all of my videos are pulled into here. So if I have a transcript or something that I want generated, I could set up another module and make, I could select which video I want, or I could just have it from now on so that whenever I upload a video, it immediately gets the transcript. I could use AI, I could generate summaries, I could send it back to a Notion database at Google Sheets. This is just a really good way to, to aggregate the news. You can do that with certain feeds like artificial intelligence as well. You can enter topics and keywords in here. So if I type in artificial intelligence and I hit enter, it's going to generate a feed based on that. And so now I have uh, all, a bunch of different AI topics coming in from a bunch of different websites. And I can, I can create posts on this stuff. I could even automate the posting process of social media even more. Or maybe if you're just uh, an AI news geek and you like looking at all the new stuff coming in, uh, you can set up an automation to have it update a Google sheet for AI news coming in. And this, this stuff gets really, really in depth. You can go to filters even. You can make sure that there's no images, no secure links. You can really do whatever you want. You can add whitelisted keywords. You can blacklist some keywords so you don't get certain posts that have something in them. So maybe I don't want posts that talk about Instagram Reels. As you can see, Instagram Reels is right here. So I could blacklist the word Reels and hit add. And now I will not get this, I will not get this post because it's hidden by the filter. And you can save your filters and really get information aggregated to you in whatever way possible and whatever way you want. And I think RSS feeds are one of the best way to start automations, especially if you're dealing with information or you want to automate social media because you can hook it up to your own social media feed, your own blog post and create even more things with these RSS feeds. Has anybody used an RSS feed in here or ha have a need for an RSS feed in here? Yes, Drake, I tried this, uh, this one out with uh, some automations I did. Oh, yeah? How do you like yeah. it? I liked it. Um, but of course, as you said, there is also a cost involved. Yep. Uh, um, and I have already Feedly. I don't know if you know that one, which is quite similar. Okay. So I'm trying to get that running also. But I have still the subscription to, uh, to this app. It's very cool. A lot of things you can do with it. I mean, you can even go to newsletters, right? You can scrape certain newsletters. Every time a new newsletter comes into one of your uh, favorite newsletters that you like, you can have all that content presented to you and make yeah. a lot of different newsletters in here. I think if you type in something like Morning Brew, I think everyone knows Morning Brew. You have that newsletter. You can create a feed around that. So whenever a new newsletter comes into that, you have that information to you and make. And then you decide what to do with that information. So very, yeah, very Yeah, like cool. you could take it, the newsletter and make a bunch of little snippet summaries of what it's about right. to see if you even want to read it. 
right. That is cool. You could create like a two sentence summary or like a, a TLDR little summary and see if see if it's something that interests you. Rem- so that's that's one cool way. Remco, can you put our or anybody put the alternative to RSS.app? You said you used for the RSS feeds. Yeah, I, in, I will... in like chat. Yeah, it's called Feedly AI. Mm. Feedly, okay. Yeah, Feedly is it's quite popular. Okay, I've I've got to actually check that one out. Do you, is, is it better than the? Um... Well, it's better. It, it, it's 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 similar. Okay, uh, but uh, it goes very in depth. If you watch it, you can you can see it. It's it, it's very very popular. Gotcha. But you can uh, also make. Uh, I have it for example. If I can, maybe. I've got some uh, topics covered. You have Feedly AI, so can you you can start a topic. For example, I like uh, a GPT prompting, for example. And nice. every time there is some some feed talking about GPT prompting, I get it in that topic. So it's mm. it's, it's similar to the, the one you're using now, but right. That's very cool. Yeah, I like I like you doing it with. Watch it. You can watch it. Okay. I like doing it with specific topics like that, you know, something that's a little more niche that doesn't actually get as much news because sometimes when it's like over overflow of news, it's just yeah. kind of too much to keep up with. But if you have something like GPT prompting, whenever something's uploaded to that, it's not, it's not happening every five minutes. It's not like a new prompting article is coming in. So that's kind of a good way to stay on top yeah. of it. Very I, set cool. it up one, I set it up one now from, uh, for Claude projects, for example, because I'm very interested in that one. Nice. So uh, I've got a feed now with with every news that is coming out of. Uh, That's awesome. Projects. You That's made a really video about idea. it. Uh, thank you for that video. Anyway, it's a great. Oh video. yeah. Oh yeah. Sure thing. Sure thing. It's very cool what that can do. It's so RSS is it, feeds. Is it similar? Can I? Is that similar to a GPT assistant? Do you think? <clears throat> yeah, I think it. I think it's pretty similar, especially the setup process. But the only thing it's a little different about GPT assistants that I think. Uh, is a little bit better than Claude is that they can actually search the web. Uh, that's kind of one of Claude's limiting factors right now is that it can't search the web. But I think the coding aspect, I think the knowledge UI, like showing you how much percentage you have left and actually using the instructions. I feel like Claude actually uses my instructions a lot better than my GPTs. And I'm it not sure. Like, if... And it sounds like, sorry to interrupt there. No, you're okay. You're okay. That, uh, it actually does when you find problems with it. Carter, you you had mentioned that you had problems with the output that you were getting. Yeah. That yep. it actually does work it work its way through. The one of the things that I've noticed with ChatGPT is sometimes, especially early on, I would ask it questions that I already knew the answer to because I was kind of testing it, <laughs> and I would say, you know, it's not possible. And I got a lot of the basically, yeah, my bad, you're right, that is impossible. Try this. <laughs> That's not possible either. Yeah, you're right. Like, <laughs> but it yes. wouldn't. It wouldn't kind of work its way through the yeah. problem. It would just say, "Yeah, you're right. I'm wrong." I've done so. exactly the same thing, uh, <laughs> knowing the answer to the question, and all it could ever do. And I think it was Claude I was doing it with. It kept telling me, it kept just ignoring what I was saying and just saying what it seemed like was the a script that it needed to follow. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It, even though I brought it around to another way of thinking or whatever you want to call it, not thinking, but just uh, another approach. And mm-hmm. I kept different approaches to go to the same, like to derive the same conclusion. And it would right. just ignore what I was saying and give me this other script that was it, almost yeah. identical every time. <laughs> I think there was somebody too. And it was one of the, one of the Thursday calls a few weeks ago. And I know Drake, you've touched on this in, in the videos, like uh, maybe in the, I don't know if it's in the, the current, community or back in the mastery community yeah but it was something to the effect that sometimes you really do have to kind of take these things in stages so you go here's what i want you to do and like basically the thing where you make it say yes i understand like where you have to oh yes like the confirmation of understanding right like so you're given it in little phases and i think somebody in the community actually said that they had to do something similar where sometimes it couldn't really handle too much at once and i guess it it may kind of relate a little bit to task splitting, but it's basically like, but in terms of the instructions, you kind of have to be incremental about it and make sure it understands yeah. part one before it can, you can work its way over its part two. And right. So and on. another another thing I noticed is it helps when you're using a large language model to say, uh, think in steps or think step by step. 
you know, when it actually walks through those, those steps of, okay, I've got to do this first. I've got to do this next rather right. than trying to, uh, when it, when you help it talk through the problem, I think it generates better responses and they've implemented that in some of the models already, but it used to be a thing when GPT three was around that it wouldn't think step by step and you had to tell it, okay, think step by step. And then it would start listing out the steps and have a much better output. So that's another way. You know, one thing else I just learned to make it more efficient is I was, I was burning through um, tokens because I was writing articles, right? And having to recheck my art. And every time it would spit it back out, yep. you have to iterate through that a few times, burning through your tokens. Um, so, and, and also it would just, it would stop halfway through and say error because it's limited so many characters, so many yeah. words. So what I started doing is saying, do it quietly. Do not output anything to the screen until I tell you to. And that solve. And and then what happened is now, she, I gotta say she because she's my voice when I talk to her. Uh, so uh, it uh, it's instant now instead of having to think and print it all. The answer right. comes back instantly too. That's very cool. That's very cool. So it's not wasting all of its response on the actual responding of it, but more so just like the reading it. I like that. The I, try, limit. I tried that with uh, doing the transcripts. Like I had 10 transcripts I wanted to reduce down to the summaries. And I, it, it was just like throwing out this large, you know, summary of what I, for each one. And I'm like, you know what, why don't you not say anything until after I've gotten like four or five of these transcripts and then start spitting out some of the the summaries right yeah you know, and something like that so yeah, yeah. no that I, makes sense i had a document that was really long that, that i couldn't process on the screen or so i told us is split the document in two and it did and then from there on in part one and part two i was able to refer to the document and get it processed nice that's cool was it smart enough to find a, a good spot to split it like logically yeah it yeah. actually broke it and put a subheading in there, part one or part two, and then gave yeah. me the document I could download. Cool. That's a good idea, actually. I like that. I, I like that. crazy when I say this, but I swear at some point I found a button on ChatGPT that was like, ask for more um, responses or the ability to get longer responses or something. And so really? then I put in why I wanted it. And I swear, so I submitted this form and I swear after I did that, I like never get cut off anymore or told like I'm past my limit. It's very strange, but I didn't get that is very strange. And yeah, or anything that like they had given me more superpowers, but I swear it worked. So I'll try and track that down for you guys. <laughs> figure yeah, out where that, it that would be awesome. It sounds like you broken the limit barrier. It sounds like you don't have any limits. <laughs> It was bizarre, but it worked. Yeah, I think I think a lot of us need that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and find it. I'm if we could, to... that would be awesome. I have a question. What's... Yeah, what's up, Larry? How do you handle that in the API? Um, like when it's doing it in the background and creating your blog post, for instance. Say you're creating an article that you're going to put on LinkedIn that's 2,400 characters long. Yeah. Right? Full-blown article, not, not a post. How do you get the GPT or the agent in the background to build your document in steps so it doesn't run out of memory? I feel like I would. Um, I feel like I, I haven't personally tried that yet because I usually don't generate that long of articles. Okay. I usually generate things that are quick reads. But um, I think I would go about that by having something where it takes in the response and generates let's say an introduction paragraph. And then in my next, I would have like five different modules, you know, five different GPT modules. I'm not sure if this would be the most efficient way to do it. This is how I would do it. And then I would have each module be responsible for a certain part. So maybe one module would be responsible for the first 500 characters. The next would be responsible for the next 500 words or characters. You know what I'm saying? So, and I would have each module reference back to what that uh, what the previous oh, the standard wrote. document outline that would be perfect. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Or you or you could use Claude projects, and you could have when it generates 
its initial response, the first 500 words or whatever, you could copy and paste that and add it as context to your text content so that it knows. And then you could say reference this. This is the first part of my blog. So I could show you a quick example of that real quick if you'd like. Um, let me pull up Claude real quick. Okay. I'll share my screen. So if you have like a blog post project, if I create a project and I call it, for instance, blog posts or LinkedIn posts, whatever you want, writing blog posts about candy. I don't really know. Maybe you're a, maybe you're a dentist and you want to write some blog posts about why candy is bad for your teeth. Well, something you could do is you could say, for instance, I know you probably have more context into what you're actually giving it, you know, yeah. and you probably have a lot of different things you can add in here, but I could say generate, or I could, I could have a, go a big, bigger goal in mind. And I could even set that in my project knowledge, add text content. I could set my project goal. I could set my custom instructions and do all that. Like an SEO agent in there too, or something like yeah. that. I mean, for LinkedIn, yeah. it probably doesn't matter as much. I probably want more of like a retention. Right. But I mean, I could say I want to create a 2400 word essay on why candy is bad for you. Um, and I know this is, this is definitely not probably what you're typing in. You've got a lot more things that you're basing it around and stuff. But this is just for an example, um, I, I, you could say I want to do this in chunks. And you could do something similar in make, like you could have the different modules set up, but maybe, maybe projects might be enough and you might not need to, to have that. Um, so I could say like generate 400 words at a time and create this article for me. Okay. Uh, and then if I send it off, I'm not sure if I actually prompted that out. Right. But the goal would be to get like a four, let's start with the first 400 words. Okay. And then it's Sorry. going to go in the first 400 words. And once you have the first 400 words, something you could do is you could copy this content or you could add it to your current project. So now it's added to the project since it's a document in Claude. Okay. okay so now, now it knows essay, why is candy bad for you? It used 1% of the knowledge. Yeah, it only uses 1% of the knowledge and has this information that it kind of references now. As you well. say continue now, and it would probably just continue right. Yeah, and, and you could just say continue. So I would just go in like those chunks, continue uh, with the next 400 words of the essay. So it has the section, previous contents remain the same, and then just piecing all of that together at the end. You could so even a little instruct bit... it to not say that like previous contents remain the same thing so that you could put the chunks together. Yeah. Yeah, that could be something you set up in custom instructions. But if you're struggling with the context limit, I would just do it like this, like just break it up into chunks. And I don't think you'll I don't think you'll deal with that really. And I also like setting up Claude projects because I know you have a lot of context and a lot of information and a lot of project knowledge actually that you are probably uploading to get these blog posts exactly how you want them. So instead of wasting all of your token limit on telling Claude how you want your blog post to be, just upload how you want that in the project knowledge. What I'm doing actually is I have a, I have a membership for perplexity. So I do my research in perplexity and okay. I do writing in either ChatGPT or Claude. Okay. So you could probably automate the research process, right? Yeah. By just entering a keyword and then having to do all your research. And then once, once you have it, all that research aggregated in one spot, what you could do is you could then upload all your research to the project knowledge and each project could be a single blog post, you know? So once you have all your research, you could, I mean, you could add a ton of PDFs. You could add text content. You know, you could go research paper uh, one and then paste in a lot of content here. Then you could set your custom instructions to reference those whenever creating blog posts, you know, make sure to reference my project knowledge. You can kind of communicate between these custom instructions and your project knowledge in order to get uh, those really the, like the very custom responses. So maybe automation, you could automate your research and then bring it into project knowledge. How much, how much space is there in project knowledge? I tried to use it and they kept saying, well, you've used too much of it. There's two, there's, PDFs. there's a 200,000 context window. And that's equivalent to a 500 page book. So wow. Quite a bit. 
Because it kept bit. saying something about 34 megs. Oh, maybe the size. That's the thing is you, you have to, they want broken down like into markdown language or something and then importing it. That's how you efficiently get it in there. Say that again. Otherwise, otherwise, you have all the overhead of the PDF and everything. You're better off to doing a copy and paste of a PDF into like a text document or into okay. a... Yeah, and you can break it up, break it up too, maybe, or maybe there's a file. I know there's a lot of file size uh, minimizers, like compressors that can compress yeah. files. And if you're just dealing with text, then it's probably not a big deal to compress it if they can still read it. Do the PDFs have images? I'm not. Uh, there's this place I found. It's called Scrib or Squib. Uh, and because uh, I uh, we, last time I asked about you know getting things off of Kindle. And, uh, and and there's a paywall, but this script that you can download PDFs of, of, of books and different things. Mm. And so I wanted to create, you know, just a, a, a knowledge base from, from these PDFs that, that I was able to get access to. Yeah, so what you do spending. is use Make. I just did this. Use Make to convert your PDFs to Markdown. Yeah. Okay. And then you take that Markdown, which is very lightweight now. It's like a text file. It's like plain text. You take that and import that into ChatGPT or, or into Claude. See, and PDFs not, are formatted and they yeah. have a lot of heavy weight and bloat in there to make okay. it look the way it does. You can automate that, or you can just do a script. If you you can do a script in, you know, in a terminal on your on your PC. There's a you do you use a a pan um, what's the utility to convert um, the Markdown. Just search, go to Perplexity and, and search convert PDF to Markdown. You okay. Know, you the tool. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Yeah, very, very helpful, Larry. Uh, good, Great. good idea. Can you again. make those uh, GPTs in Claude projects like you were showing before where you created like uh, separate uh, agents basically for, and then you would have one hierarchy agent. Oh, like the mentions feature. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you could do that in Claude. That's another thing is you can't really communicate between projects. Yeah. But you could have multiple different, I'm sure you could have different, uh, you could upload different sets of project knowledge in Claude right. and have different, like different PDFs be different agents that perform certain tasks and have that. And then have your custom instructions, like say, basically walking you through the process. Like there's five people that are going to be involved in this, all referenced mm -hmm. within the project knowledge. Mm -hmm. You are currently the, the project navigator. The project navigator tells you to go, um, go to the video editor whenever there's a video question. You know, you could kind of set it up that way and that'd be a little workaround. Yeah. I should make oh. a video on that. That's a good idea. Yeah, because I really like the idea of having, like you were always saying, to keep um, the agents kind of in their own niche, you know, their own. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like splitting it up so they're so they're professionals, basically, well, professionals at that certain task. So, Drake, yes, um, Larry, you just did this in Claude for me. Um, what, what's your thing? Thoughts about doing it in ChatGPT. So my idea, actually, how I'm building it right now is, and I have both Claude and ChatGPT, but I was doing the research in perplexity, and then the next is using uh, GPTs with agents to do the okay. the initial phase again to and then to rewrite it and the editing and you know putting it through a couple of different iterations. Um, right. I don't know if I. I think I, I mean a better writer. Yeah, I think right now Claude 3.5 is a little more cost effective, at least, but you could get a very similar effect with OpenAI assistance, especially if you're fine tuning it and your and your and your structure in it. So the output format's exactly how you want it. I I like Claude projects because I feel like it's a little more lightweight and a little bit more user friendly, but you can you can really achieve the same effect with OpenAI, I believe. If you if you do that breakup in 400 word or 500 word steps. Um, I'm not sure if those are actually 400 words. I'd probably have to check the word count on that. But I would really recommend trying to break it and then having somewhere where it can reference what it's already wrote. Yep. You know, that way it can see where to continue because... And I if, do remember, I do think that Claude remembers better than 
yeah GPT does because right now be for sure conversation and, and it just kind of forgets and you have to re-import your knowledge base can i share something really quick with jeffrey what's that then i just wrapped up a uh file converter i just created it with python on my local computer all i did from the time that we uh started was i asked claude to create it so i wanted to show it to you really quick just to inspire you guys on how quick you can solve some of these problems. So all I did was create a folder on my desktop here. I created a folder called or a file called main.py inside of it. You would need Python installed with this. For you this. would okay. need you would need Python installed, yes, and you would need VS code. But aside from that, Claude's going to tell you how to do everything. Claude will even tell you here's how to install Python. So if you need to back it up a little bit, back it up. But once you get to this point, all I have to do is paste in this code that Claude gave me. And I told it to use this uh, library called tkinter, which is going to open up like a window for me so that it's a little bit more user friendly. So when I run this, uh, tkinter not defined. Hold on, let me try to run it again. I might have to install it. So I'll do, okay, I'll do. Environment variable's gotta be set. Bip install, Kinter. You think I need to set the environment variables for this main.py with Kinter it, and bits? It said it, wasn't, it, said it wasn't, wasn't set, so try again. There it is. Okay, so now I have this simple window. All I have to do is browse. I have a PDF right here of my mid-journey instructions. Let me find a different one. Uh, I don't know exactly what this one is. It's like an MIT journal on something, but it's quite long, 30 pages, has a lot of images. So let's try it and let's just hit convert. And now it just saves it to my desktop here. And it actually turned that into just, like markdown text. That is so awesome. So wow. I just quickly use... compare the file sizes while you're at it. Okay. Uh so this one right here is 92 kilobytes. Nice. <laughs> and uh let's see what that other one is. Let's see if I can find it. Uh this original file was 445 kilobytes so it's one That's fourth a, for the file size 75 percent. no 20 25 so that's just i just wanted to inspire you guys maybe a little bit just to show you like i mean it's pretty simple to set up if you have like a little problem like that that you want to solve yeah, i've got python installed so I, i'm definitely going to check that out i appreciate mm -hmm. that man yeah, VS Code as well. VS Code, Claude, and Python. You can do anything in the world. <laughs> Pretty wild. <laughs> thanks, thanks for helping me through that, guys. <laughs> yeah, we need it. We need to set up actually a group project that we all work on something together. I forgot who had that idea, but that would be a lot of fun. Because I mean, we we could probably create something wild. Hey, we're all AIs because we keep prompting each other. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, Drake, and then build it live on a call. Build it live. Yeah. I like that. Like we could just have what exactly what Carter was doing. We could all give our input, give our instructions. We could all be running. Imagine, imagine uh, 20 people running Claude 3.5 sound at the same time. Whew. That'd be powerful. By the way, you guys saw me running into those errors and there, there were simple errors. I just had to install the right libraries. But if, even if you're running into those errors and you're not on the call here with us, just paste them, copy them right out of the terminal, paste them straight into chat GPT and be or Claude and be like, what's this error? Give me instructions on how to resolve it. And that should help you. With most basic programs, you can do quite a bit on your computer now. Mm -hmm. What's okay. up, Heather? For a sec. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been using Claude and I've been putting in this, well, I don't know if you call it a feature or a prompt, but I've been asking it for an interactive dashboard. So say... Yeah. And that is pretty remarkable. I'm able to work out a few things with that and then download it into oh, yeah. a blog. Have you been doing that? Is it is that like common knowledge or yeah, like with the with the PDF, especially when you upload a PDF and say create an interactive dashboard using React, 
you can get some, it's a very, it's actually a lot more interesting of an experience when you're trying to learn something, having yes. that dashboard, you can click through tabs. I'm not sure if you've done this, but you can even in your dashboard say, create a 10 question quiz based on the contents of the, I'm not sure if you've been doing yes, that, I've done but it. I wonder if you yeah, could render yeah. it into like a mind map or something like that too. Uh, oh yeah. Using mermaid. I'm sure you could. Yeah. I just find I'm able to work through a few things and then right. when I'm doing something, it'll come up with an answer. And then I'll say, well, what would you do to make it better? And oftentimes when I ask that question after it's a, it says, thank you for asking. And then it comes yeah. out with a really good uh, code. So that's a good, that's a good uh, prompt. Good follow-up prompt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Very cool. I love the interactive dashboard. It's probably one of my favorite use cases actually for Claude. Yeah. It's a fun way to view your PDFs. Yeah, but even if you to put that in for your make, like for a trigger, right? So yep. I was wondering if you had a doc, right? So I was working on like a scheduling for, you know, a family, three kids, and one's off to soccer, one's off to karate, <laughs> like all, all kinds of stuff going on. And so trying to make it, I made one of those interactive dashboards, but then when I downloaded it, it just made their schedule, right? Like I could wow. put in actually yeah. what their schedule is. Mm -hmm. wow. And so down it came and I put it in the dock and off it went. And now they're all using it for something. That's, That's awesome. awesome. You're yes, right. That could, that could be a, that could be a trigger. You're right. It you is know? a trigger. That's what yeah. I was saying. I like, yeah. I like how you brought it back because we were kind of getting off the, I know. I was like, <laughs> the topics. <laughs> yeah. Now we're going back on the triggers, but that's true. Like you can, you can start things by uploading that. That's another trigger, uploading a PDF, uploading a schedule, you know, and getting something created with Claude for that schedule right? Interactive dashboard and stuff like that. That's an awesome use case, Heather. You should upload it for the automations contest. You should. I should, eh? Oh, okay. You should. Hey, if you, if you, if you upload it right now and nobody else enters, you win everything. First, second, and third oh. place prize. So <laughs> well, you might as well. I you might have to well. enter maybe some private data in there or something, or uh, that's the thing I have to demo take data in there. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm working Claude. It's like, it's amazing what's happening with me because I was using it for my assessments, as I was saying to you before. And right. I, I, yeah, it's kind of blowing my mind. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mind so I'm trying to, I'm trying to just it. get calmed down and not go too high. Right. Um, <laughs> right. And just use it for simple everyday things. Cause that's really where you save most of your time, unless you're a researcher or something. So anyway, I thought I'd put it there. Yeah. thank Fair you for point. sharing Heather. Thank, thank you. you for sharing. Yeah, you're welcome. That was pretty much all I had for the presentation, actually. Uh, I mean, webhooks are another thing you can use in order to uh, to start uh, to start certain things and to have certain to have to have a a trigger. Webhooks are powerful for starting automations. It sends real time data when specific events occur in a different app or service. For example, this is one I used that I showed last call. If you were on the first automations unlocked call, where when somebody pays for my course. I have a Zapier automation that is using a Stripe webhook for that live action. So it sees somebody bought the course. It has a line item title of ChatGPT Mastery. So I need to invite this member to the ChatGPT Mastery course in school. That's something that saves me a lot of headaches. It's a three-step automation. Checkout session in Stripe, a filter to see if they bought ChatGPT Mastery, and then inviting them to school. That's something that I would have had to do manually every time somebody purchased saves on customer support and also, you know, just saves me time. Something so simple, but that's an example of using a webhook. Carter showed you an example of using a webhook in Airtable. I'm not going to act like I know all the fancy terminology and like I know exactly how every part of a webhook works or an API. But what I do know is that, you know, you can send real-time data when specific events occur in different apps or services to make. That way make can trigger more actions based around that. So, you know, I could set up a completely uh, automated process for when somebody checks out, you know, I get them invited to school, I send them an email, maybe I have something working in the background in Notion, updating them in a database, adding something in Google Sheets, generating, you know, a little paragraph with OpenAI or Claude based on their name, having it be very custom. And yeah, that's something that you could use a webhook for. The truth is, though, there are hundreds of different ways to start your automations. Um, we've learned more of this call than what I even had on this presentation. Thank you, Heather, for sharing. I really like that example. And we've had plenty of different other people chip in. So I appreciate your uh, your involvement and just giving, giving the community some ideas. So now I just wanted to get in some open discussion while we wrap up this call. If anybody wants to uh, talk about anything, uh, I have a little statement here. What are events in your professional or personal lives that could trigger automations that you're thinking of or that you've thought out 
uh, throughout this call. I think that would be a fun spot to end. Um, so if you have any events or any actions or any databases that could be watched in your professional or personal lives, um, what kind of automations could that trigger or what events could trigger certain, certain automations in, in your guys' life? Cause I know for, for me, it's the Stripe thing. You know, I want to automate customer support. I want to have some of the best customer support. So if I can automate that task to send out an email that's personalized uh, and speaks in my language and gets their name right, you know, those are things that we could do with software in the past, but it's a lot more custom experience, custom of an experience because you can train AI on your entire knowledge database and everything about your company by just uploading a couple of PDFs. So that's something for me that it's an event that happens when somebody buys my course. I really like having that automation process uh, or whenever I upload a YouTube video, I like being able to create newsletters out of that. It kind of duplicates myself because I can train AI to talk like me and write newsletters exactly how I would write them. But all I have to do is upload a YouTube video. I don't have to be in multiple places at once watching my YouTube video, remembering what I said, writing it down. You know, it's a big time saver and it's not like it's bad quality content. It's really good quality content. And I make sure of that in a testing and revision stage. Mm -hmm. I have an idea or maybe it's not. Um, I'm going to be setting up and doing more consultations. So I work Tuesday to Saturday and I'm going to be setting it up where because normally I control uh, the sessions that I'm going to be having. I won't, but calen calendar, calendar, I could set it up. Yeah, I could set it up yep. that if, if if somebody else goes in and they set it up because I'll say, okay, here's four sessions on this Monday and anybody can go in and book a consult. That way there, I would get a trigger when somebody goes in and does it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, that would work. That's very right. cool. That's very yeah. cool. Because I'm, I'm going to be doing other things. If I'm in the middle of yeah. a couple of consultations, I can get a I can get a notification if somebody is booking me for for tomorrow. Oh yeah, just kind of how I sh I'm not sure if you were here in the beginning, but there's no, I wasn't. I missed called the Vibit. I'll put oh, it in yeah. the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I did hear that. Okay, yeah, like Vibit is something that you can set up so that when something happens, you can set that mm -hmm. up and make. You know, like when somebody books a consultation, it sends an it sent automatically sends a notification to my phone. Because I mean, the, my yes. phone is something I have by me all day, but sometimes I don't have my Gmail notifications because I get hundreds of emails per day. I don't want those always coming on my phone. So if I get something from a specific sender as well, it triggers a notification. It can trigger a notification or if I have a certain. That's exactly where I got the idea. Well, not really. The, I mean, kind of, I got the idea there because I'm thinking, I, you know, someone could fill up those four, right? And all of a sudden my Friday is gone. And so then I might not do anything on the Thursday afternoon. So it's yeah information i could use in real time yeah okay. for sure like notifications that, are huge we mm -hmm. have that built into our SaaS as well where people can go to book a demo call and then they they go to a calendar and it, it gives them the options that we have available and we usually space them out maybe an hour apart or whatever because the calls may only take about 30 45 minutes and that way we could just do demo calls all day if that's <clears throat> however many booking times we have available and then What's interesting is that we can also, if they book the call and then cancel, it sends them yes. an email to cancel the call. And then they then it sends another automated message back to rebook the call on another time and date. That's good. because Or maybe same day, but just a different time that's available. So there's that, that constant yes. back and forth. And then we have automations that remind them uh, maybe the day before and then maybe 30 minutes before or something like that. Jeez. Right. Okay. Nice. Well, you you need that automation so that they will remember. Of course. So yeah. easy to forget. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, it's the first time I'm letting anybody else book. Right. So usually I book the sessions because I need control over that. The consultations I won't. But that's a good thing to think about, too, because they can't cancel, of course. Mm -hmm. right, right. We want them to be able to rebook the call or the, the right. consultation on their own if in the time slots that you have available that you okay. will, that you determine. Right. right. Okay. Good point. Very cool. Yeah. Good points, everyone. Yeah. But if anybody has any other questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise we can, we can end the call. I'm sure we could go down a lot more rabbit holes here. Just one generic question, guys. Um, yes. What's up, Remco? If they're coming new uh, models, for example, Claude 4, 
uh, sonnet, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, do you how do you refine your prompts or your uh, your assistance? Are you doing that manually, or are you asking GPT or Claude to refine them for the new model? How do you do that? I kind of see where uh, where where the model stands out in regards to my instructions. What I like to do though is well, what I've seen at least is I can kind of keep my instructions, honestly. And uh, it seems as the models get better, it gets better with my current instructions. So I kind of like see, testing it out and seeing how it works with my current instructions. But of course, there are new features that are added, for example, like the artifacts feature and all those new things we can do with Claude. So Carter actually has a good way of going about this that I really like. He has some uh, that, that I'm not sure if you've seen that web scraper tool that he made where you can scrape the documentation no but okay well he has this this tool that he created with python similar to the one that he just showed us uh how he created it with claude but it allows you to go to the documentation of a certain tool or update notes for example we could go to the claude projects update um claude project update and mm -hmm. we could you know copy that copy that url and then get all of the contents from that and then you could go to something like claude and say here are my current instructions. Here is my update. Uh, here is the updated information on this app. Uh, combine these two to make it to make it um, to make one set of instructions based on the new updates. That's something you could do. But yeah, I've been kind of updating manually, honestly. Okay. Something I like to tweak with and have some fun with. <laughs> yeah. There are systems yep. you can set up and make as well, where you could make it set up your. Uh, agent selection so you could have different models uh quickly available to swap in and out and switch the the model that you're using if you use something like a like a router and make yeah yeah and then you can watch the compare you can compare the different outputs of course yeah yeah the different output tokens you can you can have it uh give you the output tokens and you can have it give you the costs you can have it give of course the actual output is going to play a part in which one you decide to use so yeah you can you can get all of that information okay thank you you know you know what would be interesting is to uh create another thread maybe it'd be better if you, one of you two were to uh create it where you ask um basically what are the projects you're working on what are the hurdles you're having and, you know, yeah. as we find them or as we discover new ways or interesting things that we're trying to do that we may need to help with, it, it's all in that one thread and we can mm. just go down and we can all maybe find where other people are having issues. Or right. Something. Like like, that. It's hard to come up with on a call, like maybe last minute. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know what you mean. To, mm -hmm. I like it. I like it. I'll create a thread or you can and I'll pin it. I can pin a thread that you create too, Keith, if you, if you'd like. Are you talking well, about I didn't know how you'd want to? Yeah, I didn't want know how you'd want us, you know, bring it up. Yeah. So yeah, let that you makes guys sense. think about it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the suggestion. I love it. I think it's a great idea. That way, we have all that information consolidated too, so we don't have to go back in the call. You know, where did they say what? We can just have a chat thread or a topic or a category that we go through, and we actually. Um, get, get the help get the help we need by database. yes <laughs> could do that could do that very cool because yeah, i come up with different things that i'm you know be interested in knowing how to do maybe it's in one of your training modules you know for sure you could point to be a lot easier for sure i like that thank you for sharing keith thank you for sharing all one. right yeah, very good one. If that's all, then uh, thank you everyone for showing up and participating. Highly, highly appreciate it. Super helpful when everyone's chipping in. Uh, for real, it's uh, I learned so much from everyone here. So thank you. And I hope that you could take away some good information on starting your automations with this call right here. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the community. And also be on the lookout for the live call replays that we will be upla uploading very shortly on this AI automation series.